Hello and welcome to the Department of Healthcare Access and Information or HCI, formerly OSHPOD, Code Application Notice or CAN 2-11B titled Accessibility in Healthcare Facilities brought to you by the Building Standards Unit here at HCI. During today's presentation, we'll be going over change in occupancy, use or function, maintenance and repair, scoping requirements, existing buildings and facilities, and much, much more. If you haven't done so already, feel free to download today's presentation presented to you or provided to you in PDF format, and you can access that under the handout section of the GoTo panel there on your screen. Again, you can access those through the handout section on the GoTo panel if you haven't done so already. You'll download those handouts so you can follow through or follow us on the during the presentation, or you, you can also go use those at a later time. Also available for you is the is CAN 2-11B, also available for your use. You will be here for about a two hour presentation. You will all be muted during the presentation, but we'll have an opportunity to raise your hand at the end of the presentation so we can have an open dialogue with you and answer the questions that you have the best of our ability. During the presentation, if you do have a question, feel free to type the question into the question section of the GoTo panel and we'll answer those questions uh, as we go through the presentation as well. If you do have a specific question, feel free to send us an email over to regsunit at hki.ca.gov. Again, that's R-E-G-S-U-N-I-T at hki.ca.gov. During the presentation, please feel free to keep your questions generic, but if you have a specific question or you want to have a more in-depth conversation with us, feel free to send us an email over to that email address that we shared with you. If the presentation experiences transmission difficulties, feel free to log back, log off, log back in using the same login information that the GoTo software sent you, and we will do the same if we experience transmission difficulties on our end. So today for presenters, we have Mr. Richard Tannehill. He is a senior architect and supervisor for the Building Standards Unit. And we also have Mr. Bill Zilmer, which is AIA and CAST certified and is also a program manager for, for Sutter Health within the Physical Access and Regulatory Affairs Division. He's also an architect. He's also a former OSHPOD employee. He's with Sutter Health Accessibility Expert, CAST certified, and also part of the HPS Fear uh, Committee. So, Richard, if you're there, the presentation is all yours. Thank you, Caesar, and welcome everyone. Uh, Bill got much more accolades than I do, so. <laughs> ah. okay. uh, today we're going to be talking about accessibility in healthcare. Uh, CAN 2-11B is uh, fairly new. It's been pretty much been completely renovated or gone over and providing a lot hopefully a lot clearer information for you with a lot more examples today's presentation uh, as caesar mentioned is going to be about two hours probably an hour and a half for the presentation and we have time for questions and answers now note there's going to be a lot of text in this because we're actually going over the the can uh, so there'll be a lot of text in the slides and a lot of reading but a lot of examples and a lot of discussion on it so first i'd like to just thank bill zelmer for helping me out with this and we'll go ahead and get started okay uh, just a reminder that uh, as caesar mentioned this, we are we did, gone through a name change. We are now called HCI. We had a lot of questions on that. Mm -hmm. um, HCI is uh, the Department of Healthcare Access and Information. Um, our role here will not change, and you'll see a lot of references both to OSHPOD and to HCI as we go through this presentation, and as well as uh, in the code. The uh, building code has not changed our name. So the references that are specific in the code, like OSHPOD 1, 2, and 3 buildings, uh, will remain OSHPOD. That's just a heads up, because it might cause a little confusion. So I'm Richard Tannehill. I'm the supervisor of the Building Standards Unit at HCI. 
And with me today, we, as uh, Caesar mentioned, we have Bill Zelmer uh, from Cetera Health. He's a program manager there. He, but he's also a CASP expert and also does his own uh, ADA training for annually, don't you, Bill? Yeah, pretty much through our local AIA chapter. Uh, we typically do one five hour every year, although we haven't scheduled it for 2022 yet. Okay. Um, I noticed that there's already a question about AIA credits on this. Uh, once, if you're attending this webinar, you will get a certificate that you attended, and you do need to self report that to the AIA. Okay. So again, we're going to be looking at the actual CAN, CAN 2-11B, um, as we go through this uh, presentation. And we're going to be looking at uh, pretty much going through it from beginning to end and looking at the examples and discussing it. So hopefully it'll provide better clarity to you all when you're actually using the CAN. And as Caesar also mentioned, uh, it is available for download as one of the handouts here. And you can also access it from the HKI website. So first we're gonna look at the meaning and purpose of CAN 211B. The purpose of this CAN is to clarify sections in the 2019 California Building Code in order to provide consistent application and accessibility regulations as they relate to new construction and alteration of healthcare facilities under the jurisdiction of HKI. Okay, this CAN only addresses accessibility requirements associated with CBC Chapter 11B, functional and clinical requirements in Chapter 12, and or exiting requirements in Chapter 10 may also apply. Okay, project elements must be compliant with all relevant California Building Standard Code requirements. So a little bit of background, uh, the Division of State Architect, uh, access compliance adopted uh, adopts Title 24 in the, in the California Building Code with the, re, the all the requirements relating to accessibility for persons with disabilities. Okay, the purpose of these code requirements is to ensure a barrier-free design is incorporated in all buildings, facilities, site work, additions, alterations, and structural repairs. Okay, HKI only uh, enforces the DSA AC accessibility code requirements for hospitals, skilled nursing facilities, and intermediate care facilities. So DGS and the DSA actually do have code writing and adoption authority over accessibility requirements, and HKI only enforces it. There are two standards for accessibility in California, uh, one that we're talking about today, the California Building Code, and that is uh, our primary resource. Um, there is also the ADA standards and uh, state law requires that CBC standards um, at least meet the ADA minimum level. Some requirements in California are even more strict. Um, nonetheless, the, the ADA has concepts that are not in the CBC, so it's also uh, can, remains a good reference material. Accessibility within a building is addressed in two ways in California. So I just went over that, didn't I? So I'm gonna skip over that one. Okay, even though existing non-compliant conditions may not be required to be corrected as part of a project, uh, this does not relieve the facility of providing legal accessibility compliance required by ADA within their facilities. So in other words, all the owners are currently responsible to have full compliance. Um, all the that chapter two that dash 11b does is provide guidance to make that accessible and also to help through the section 202 is help make non-accessible conditions uh, more accessible which are triggered by projects and uh, construction again just want to emphasize that the even though a project may not say require a certain thing to be brought into compliance the owner is still liable for having that in compliance. It's just not going, may not be triggered by the project. So with that, I'm going to pass path of travel to Bill. 
Yeah, thank you, Richard. So um, what we're gonna launch into here, the next couple of slides will be the brand new flow chart for Path of Travel. Uh, thank you, perfect. So uh, hats off to the folks at HCAI that put this together. If uh, those of you that are listening have not yet used this, I think you're really gonna like it. It is, um, in my opinion, a, a step in the right direction for a whole lot of reasons. So we'll go through kind of a hypothetical and go through this one box at a time. Go ahead and click the first one, Richard. So obviously you start with defining the scope. Once you have the scope defined, then it goes to all important box number two. So this, again, in my opinion, and I think Richard would agree, th this does present a break from the past in the way that HCAI has interpreted things previously, at least in some respects. So this box number two is all important. If you are doing no construction, you go off to box number three and the project is exempt from the path of travel requirements. Now it doesn't mean the project is exempt, but the path of travel won't be triggered. So typically that might be a change of occupancy or change of use where your client may be saying, hey, but we're not gonna do any construction. We're just gonna change the occupants or more frequently the type of function of the space. That means in HKI's way of, of doing this, it will not trigger path travel. So that's a big deal. Uh, we'll get into that in a little more detail later. Then if we can go on to box number four, if you go the other direction, if you do have construction, the construction is what triggers the path of travel. And of course, if we use the term path of travel like everybody knows what it is. I, I would assume most all of you have dealt with this many, many times in your healthcare arena. So those five items there, the primary entrance to the building, the toilet and bathing facilities, the drinking fountains, telephones, and signage, all of that would be triggered to be compliant to current code. Now, the, of course, the flow chart continues because that's not the end of the story. Then when we go out to box five, there's exceptions. And those of you that have, are code geeks will uh, remember, I think there's 10 different exceptions to this section of the code. And we're in 11B202.4 that defines that path of travel. So these exceptions go one at a time, one, two, three, four, all the way up through exception number 10. This box number five defines that if the uh, exceptions one through seven either do or don't apply, you go either to the left or right. So where do we go next with this one? So if the answer is yes, one of those exceptions apply, then your project is exempt from the path of travel. Again, the project itself has to comply to code. They always do, obviously but triggering those toilet rooms, et cetera, you'd be exempted from that if you qualify for those exceptions. Now, if you, in fact, don't comply with that exception, still there are, are more exceptions. So this box number seven is, does the uh, construction cost, the adjusted construction cost, exceed the valuation threshold? So I, I took a look last night, uh, DSA, has not yet, at least as of last night when I looked, uh, changed the amount for the 2022 calendar year. What it was last year was 172,000. So if your project is above or below 172,000, it either kicks you over to an exemption in box eight. Um, yeah. So where you're obligated to spend at least 20% of your construction budget on accessibility features. Um, now, if you go down the other direction in, uh-oh. Sorry, something weird happened there. Wow. I have no yeah. idea. Give me one second. That's it. Well, that was weird. Well, I guess if you wanna to skip to the end, all right. Um, so back on the that um, 
twenty percent thing, then if your your threshold, your construction project is over one hundred and seventy two thousand dollars, you don't qualify for that exception, which I believe is exception number eight. Then you go down to box number nine, and there's yet another question, another qualifier. Do you have an unreasonable hardship that you can request? So there are times where we've got big projects. It may be a $10 million project, but the nature of it is such that providing full compliance might constitute a hardship, and you can pitch your case to HCI. That would be going to box number 10, right? Yeah. Or yeah. if, yeah, so then if either HCI says, no, we don't agree that it's a hardship, or if you yourselves look at it and you don't believe it constitutes a hardship, then you'd go to box number 11. And do you have a technically infeasible situation? Um, yes or no. And then it leads you either to full compliance as required and that as a reminder, the 11B202.4 in that box 13, that is the path of travel, your toilet room stuff. Or alternately, uh, if you are presenting a, a situation that is technically infeasible, you'd go down to box number 12 and you'd be required to provide equivalent facilitation. So we'll explain in a little more detail some of the pieces and parts of that in future slides, but that's kind of the big picture. So Richard, I, I probably should stop talking. Was there anything else you wanted to add to all of that? No, actually you covered it pretty well. Thank you. Okay, so this next slide is some definitions. Is this, uh, yeah, this is still me. So an alteration, that's what you see on screen is right out of the code word for word. The important piece is uh, shown in red text, a change in occupancy or use or structural repair to an existing building or facility. That piece of it is central to the definition as we discuss these issues. Uh, next uh, slide. Another definition out of the code is a change in function. So interestingly, if you look for this, definition in the code. It's not in chapter two with all the other definitions. This is in chapter 1224, where there is more healthcare definitions, which HCI is more in charge of. So there is a definition in the code in 1224 for change in function. Um, we could read the whole text here, but I think most of you can read that for yourselves. Um, in layman's terms, this is changing from one code category to another, more or less. So if you've got, we'll give some examples in a few minutes. Yeah, what's important here is it specifically states that uh, the functional requirements uh, under a different code subsection will have to be met. Thank you. Um, next, and then the change of occupancy. This is probably the, most familiar term, uh, the change of occupancy, if you've got a B occupancy or an I occupancy and you're proposing to change from one to the other, obviously there's implications to that. Uh, next slide. And then, so Richard, I may need your help on this. I don't know if this is a recent definition in code or not, uh, but whether yeah, it is just, or isn't. Yeah, it's, it's they added repair, I believe is in 2019 section uh, for reconstruction or renewal of any part of an existing building for the purpose of its maintenance or to correct damage. And that was really to uh, clarify between maintenance, repair, and an alteration. And I would uh, add my two cents worth, again, my opinion, this is a really good thing for the industry. What HCI is doing is defining repair so that they can effectively exempt some projects. So if you're just repairing something, it will not be interpreted as triggering a whole bunch of accessibility. And now there's a definition in the code that says if it's if it's a repair, then uh, they're, they're allowed to interpret it. So this is a real good thing. 
So the change of occupancy or use uh, in a little bit more detail. Um, so a change in the major activity for which the room space or unit is intended, a change in occupancy or use can occur whether construction is performed or not. Examples of a change of occupancy or use include bullet point one there, the changing the occupancy classification, kind of obviously from a, say an I to a B. The second bullet point, changing a patient room to storage, that's changing probably both the occupancy and the use. Uh, the third bullet point, changing an intensive care unit to a perinatal unit and changing med surge units to acute psych rehab or distinct part sniff. And finally, changing a general acute care hospital to a skilled nursing facility. Next slide. I'll be right there, just, sorry. And then we've got an example of what is not a change of occupancy. So changing patient rooms in a nursing service space from general nursing to antipartum or postpartum patient rooms is not a change in use. So it's, again, in layman's terms, the way I would put it, it was used as a patient bedroom for nursing purposes and it still is. It's just a different variety of it. So you're changing not the occupancy or use, what you're changing there would be the function. Uh, changes in occupancy or use may occur, may require additional plumbing fixtures and or se additional segregated staff, patients and visitors, um, typically toilet rooms. Uh, next slide. If construction is not performed, the path of travel requirements 11B202.4 do not apply. Again, I think that's a big deal. Uh, we do and run into that so, from time to time. I'm sorry, go ahead. Somebody asked the question about 11B204. Yes, that is in the building code. It's a chapter 11B of this California building code. Next slide. Then we have the change in occupancy or use. Uh, another explanation, placing patient rooms in suspense without performing construction and not using the space during the period where they are in suspense is not a change in use or occupancy and does not initiate compliance with accessibility requirements. If I can pause for a moment, um, the what we've experienced in the past, and of course, as time passes, HKI and the, and the folks that are doing plan review, sometimes the interpretations do change. I remember a, a time where this sort of thing was sort of used as a vehicle to require more accessibility. Well, now the good news is it's not. If you're not doing construction and you're just putting a room in suspense, not gonna be a change in occupancy and it will not trigger these ADA requirements. Okay, go ahead, Richard. Now, uh, a little different spin on that, placing patient rooms in suspense without construction and then using the space for a different purpose during the period that they are in suspense, that may be a change in occupancy or use and that may initiate compliance with accessibility requirements. So you do need to keep an eye on what are your clients really doing when they put rooms in suspense? An example would be if the suspended patient room contains an adjoining toilet room and the patient room is used as a waiting room. As you recall, waiting rooms are required to have toilet rooms. So the adjoining toilet room must be an accessible one. Well, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what's happening, sorry. That's twice. I know, I've never seen that before. Okay. Zoom, zoom, there we go. Um, <clears throat> so this is the second one, last line there is another example. Thank you, I appreciate that. So if the suspended patient room is used, however, 
as an office, the adjoining toilet room would not be required to be accessible. And that is really the difference between code says you have to have toilet rooms for your waiting room. Code does not say you have to have toilet rooms specifically to serve an office. And so that will either trigger or not trigger having that toilet room need to be accessible. Removing patient rooms from suspense without performing construction is not a change in the primary function and does not initiate compliance with accessibility. However, compliance with Chapter 11B is required if construction is performed in placing patient rooms in suspense or removing them. So I think we've, we've said that a couple of different ways. Uh, next slide. So then the change in function, I think this is probably a little more mysterious and a little less familiar to everybody. <clears throat> so we'll go through this. Let me read the definition first. A change in function is a change from a room, space, or unit satisfying specific functional requirements associated with a CBC subsection under sections 1224, 5, 6, or 8 to satisfy specific functional requirements of a different subsection. A change in function will require an altered room or space to comply with accessibility requirements. A change in licensed bed category that does not change the accessibility under the section 11B223 or 223.2 or 3 will not require the repurposed patient bed or toilet rooms to be altered if no other alterations are made to the room. So there's a, a whole lot of text there. Um, we'll, we'll share a couple of examples to explain that. So this first example, changing a med surge unit or, or room to pediatric nursing. A med surge unit, the example here, has been satisfying the requirements of CBC section 1224.14 for many, many years and is now repurposed to satisfy the requirements under section 1224.30 for pediatric nursing. So obviously if you open the code and look into these two different code sections, there are two different sets of requirements. Under the pediatric nursing, the requirements for a play area and infant formula space is required and will need to be met as part of your repurposing project. So for the purpose of this example, very unlikely you already have a play area, so you will have to almost certainly build one. The play area that's required must have a patient toilet room adjacent to it per this code section and let me uh, process this next paragraph here. A new play area and accessible toilet room will be constructed, which will satisfy those functional requirements. The new toilet room, of course, must be accessible and may not be counted as a path of travel element that's associated with the 202.4. So the point of that, Yes, you have to have the play area. Yes, it has to have a toilet room. And yes, it has to be accessible. And you do not get to count that as part of that 20% if you're under that 20% obligation because that's part of your base project, making your base project satisfy the code. The path of travel requirements will be triggered by this construction. Now we need to be clear it's not accessibility triggering yet more accessibility. What this is, is the functional requirements are triggering construction. That construction is triggering accessibility. So in this case, you will have to provide two staff toilet rooms. And of course, they will have to meet current code for accessibility. So there's a lot to that. Um, did I cover all that, Richard? I know there's a lot going on there. Yeah. Yeah, we'll have a lot we'll more examples of that. Okay. All right, All thank right. you, Bill. I get to continue with some more examples. So looking at the med surge unit to pediatric nursing unit, same scenarios uh, Bill just discussed above, um, except the space exists that can be used for a play area, and there is a, an existing non-accessible staff toilet adjacent to it. 
okay? If the existing non-accessible staff toilet is designated as the required patient toilet, it may continue to be used as is as part of the change in function. There's no upgrades required because of an existing toilet and it's remaining, uh, it's just changing from a staff toilet to a patient toilet. That is a required element of construction. If there are sufficient required staff toilets serving the nursing unit, since you just took away one of the staff toilets, a new staff toilet does not need to be created to meet the functional requirements of the pediatric unit. So in other words, if you had an existing toilet that's gonna be repurposed as the from the staff toilet to the patient unit, it can remain as is. Again, it behooves the owner to provide accessibility, but it's not gonna trigger the requirement. Looking at another similar example, um, med surge to a pediatric unit. In this case, there is a existing non-accessible staff toilet serving the nursing unit. Okay, this toilet may be designated as a patient toilet and continue to be used. If there are sufficient required staff toilets serving the nursing unit already in place, a new staff toilet does not need to be created to meet the functional requirements for the pediatric unit. If the existing toilet, then the existing toilet may be upgraded under the path of travel requirements if the other work requires path of travel upgrades. So in this case, you have an existing toilet that's gonna remain as, could remain as is, but path of travel is triggered from other construction on the project. So now that non-compliant existing toilet can be upgraded as part of the path of travel requirement, the 20%, as opposed to the example that Bill discussed where it was a required toilet being put in and couldn't be applied to the path of travel. It gets confusing and that's why we provide so many examples of this, but it's, it's very clear if a toilet is required to be provided, it has to be provided and um, be in place. Um, the construction is what's gonna be triggering the path of travel. So if there's construction, then the 20% can be applied to the path of travel elements. Moving on to maintenance and repair. Um, maintenance and non-structural repair applies to reconstruction or renewal of any part of an existing building for the purpose of maintenance or to correct damage. Maintenance includes the excluded maintenance projects uh, listed in the field review or in the Freer manual. Normal maintenance, re-roofing, and changes to the mechanical and electrical system not affecting the usability of the building. These are not subject to accessibility requirements. However, replacement of elements associated with the accessible route, such as damaged doors, will need to comply with accessible hardware requirements as noted in the Freer Manual. So if you're replacing something and being put in new, it does need to comply. So when you're replacing equipment, equipment replacement that meets the general functional specification of the item being replaced, is not a change in function, nor by itself an alteration. It's an equipment replacement and is treated as such. Okay, the definition cites mechanical and electrical equipment as examples. However, this understanding also extends to planned replacement of other equipment as well. For example, if a CT scanner is being replaced with a new CT scanner, the room is still a CT scan room and does not cause the room to be brought into further compliance with current code as long as the space or the room complies with the requirements of the 2001 CBC or later edition um, for existing rooms continuing to serve the same function. So as 2001 was a major change in how the code uh, was looking at room sizes. So that's why that comes into play there. But basically, if it was in compliance with the code when it was built, and you're just changing out the piece of equipment, nothing else is gonna be triggered unless that forces you into a larger space or doing reconfiguration of the room that causes additional construction. However, replacement of equipment shall not decrease the accessibility of the space, room, 
or building below that which the equipment configuration currently provides. So if you're putting in a larger piece of equipment, we ran into this just earlier, uh, a few weeks ago, um, where the new CT scanner was larger in footprint than the one it was replacing and no longer met the clearance requirements in the room. And then the room is gonna be forced to be larger for the safety of the patient and for the access to the equipment. And that would trigger accessibility because now you're being forced to move walls. Again, if the alterations are made to the space, room, or building, in addition to what is required for the replacement of the equipment, such alterations must comply with accessibility and other code requirements for new construction. So anything new going to the room needs to meet current code requirements. Hey, Richard, can yes. I add my two cents worth? Um, just a word to the wise on this. So Richard made a point earlier that the facilities are still legally liable. I think this is a case where you could be replacing a piece of equipment where the cost is maybe a million dollars or more. HCI is defining the way they will process accessibility. But I know at Sutter Health, we work with probably 50 other building departments at the city and county level. They may or may not do it the same way. So we do find we'll have replacement of a piece of medical equipment that's either in an OSHPA jurisdiction or HCAD jurisdiction, it gets handled one way. A very similar piece of equipment being replaced in another jurisdiction, word to the wise, check with that jurisdiction and see how do they interpret the replacement of equipment there, because it may not be the same. Right. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, and when we're looking at equipment replacement like this, um, we could look at the act, the cost of the installation of that equipment as well. Okay, let's look at structural repair. Uh, for the purposes of this CAN, structural repair is divided into two categories, structural work and non-structural work. So we'll look at those. Um, structural work is actually, a, this came out of a attorney general's opinion back in 1995, where the attorney general of the state of California stated that the seismic strengthening work in the existing building con constitutes a building alteration, structural repair or, or addition, and therefore uh, needs to comply with providing access to the building for the persons with disabilities. So structural repair projects and seismic retrofit projects for the purpose of compliance with structural performance category SPCC, SPC uh, requirements of the 2019 administrative code and this building code are subject to access requirements. Okay. So compliance for structural repair with 11B202, which is your path of travel requirements, shall be provided as follows. 11B202.4 requires provisions of the accessible, accessible primary entrance, toilet and bathing facilities, drinking fountains, signs, public telephones, and the accessible path of travel connecting these elements throughout the building. And note here, when it says public telephones, those are not pay phones. Those are just phones that can be accessed by the public. It can be a phone on a wall or a phone on a desk. It just has to be a phone that someone can call out of the hospital. I don't think probably part of our audience doesn't even know what a pay phone is anymore. So the specific area of alteration shall comply with all accessibility requirements as noted in section B202.3. Note that for some structural repair or retrofit work, either interior or exterior, the specific area of the alteration may not occur in a room or space intended for human occupancy. In other words, um, a lot of the structural stuff can be above ceiling, it can be in um, roof areas or penthouses, it can be all over the building just to do a size, uh, an upgrade requirement. In such cases, the requirements of 202.3, while enforceable, have no practical application. Similarly, 
providing a path of travel to such area has no practical application. In other words, you can't provide the path of travel everywhere to the building. This does not mean that path of travel may be omitted, but should be applied based on a required percentage or costs, not necessarily the location of the alteration. Okay, and what we're talking about there, we have done a, did a uh, seismic upgrade on a building. Uh, we, we're touching the building all over the place. Um, a lot of it's above the ceiling, at the roof connections, at column connections, um, just retrofitting existing steel. Um, since it was determined that structural repair does require path of travel compliance, that compliance can be considered um, and applied at one location or several locations, depending on what best fits the facility. The requirements 11B202 shall not be construed to require an entire building to be subject to accessibility upgrades due to a structural repair or retrofit project. Okay, 11B202 is consistent with the Health and Safety Code, which states every existing public accommodation constructed prior to July 1970, which, not, which is not exempted by the law, shall be subject to the requirements of this chapter when any alteration, structural repairs, or additions are made to such public accommodation. Okay, here's the meat of this, is the requirement shall only apply to the area of a specific alteration, structural repair, or addition, and shall not be construed to mean the entire building or facility. Okay, and that is not the intent of 11B202, is to upgrade the whole building, but again, get that 20% and focus it in a specific area to provide accessibility uh, as much as possible within that amount. Continuing with uh, structural repair with non-structural work, projects consisting entirely of anchoring and bracing of equipment and components will not be considered a building alteration, renovation, structural repair, or retrofit project subject to the Attorney General's opinion. Okay. Similarly, seismic retrofit projects for the purpose of compliance with non-structural performance category MPC requirements are not subject to the accessibility requirements. Okay. Incidental structural repairs, uh, as described in the existing building code, the part 10, is intended to apply or simply restore a damaged building component to its pre-damaged state and is not included in the structural repair work described above. Okay, definition here, structural repairs are any changes affecting existing or requiring new structural components primarily intended to correct the effects of damage, deterioration, or impending actual failure regardless of cause. Sorry, there's a lot of information on this because as you can see, there's already been a statute written about it. Excuse me one second. Sorry, I have some machine going off in the background. And now I can get my slides to transfer. Okay. okay, an example of this is dry rot repair. Replacing a damaged door or window may reveal uh, damage to the surrounding frame. Okay, corrective repair would require replacement in kind to restore the red structure to its pre-damaged condition and still not trigger path of travel upgrades. You're just replacing the, the window. You have to do some minor repairs around the framing that is not constituted as construction that would trigger additional accessibility, okay? By contrast, structural upgrade is subject to path of travel requirements as discussed under structural work addressed previously. Bill, I think this is yeah, back to you. I'm sorry, I was, I was looking. So we've got a number of questions. You may wanna look at those and see if you wanna hold those to the end or not. Um, and I'll move on with this slide. So another definition, uh, we have the unreasonable hardship. Uh, the information shown there in the box is word for word right out of the code. So I'll read through this first part of it. When the enforcing agency finds an emphasis on when the enforcing agency 
finds that compliance with the building standard would make the specific work of the project affected by the building standard infeasible based on the overall valuation of the following factors, the cost of providing access, cost of construction, impact of proposed improvements, the nature of the accessibility that would be gained or lost and the nature of the use of the facility, details of any finding of unreasonable hardship shall be recorded and entered in the files of the enforcing agency. So that's definition right out of the code. Next slide. So there's two types of unreasonable hardship in the CBC chapter 11B. Next slide. One type as defined in section 202 applies to all projects, regardless of construction cost of the project. Next slide. The second type applies to the alterations, structure repairs, or additions that do not exceed the valuation threshold from 11B202.4. I think you saw that in the flow chart that we talked about earlier. And as we noted, the valuation threshold changes each year. Division of the state architect is in charge of that. Um, so accessibility must be provided to the maximum extent feasible. So in determining equivalent facilitation, consideration shall be given to means that provide for the maximum independence of persons with disabilities while presenting the least risk or harm, injury or other hazard to such persons or others. That too is uh, part of the definition in chapter two. So when you want to request unreasonable hardship, there is a way to do that through HCI you would fill out an alternate method of compliance, providing your backup information. And then, of course, you want to propose something. Uh, you would propose doing something to the maximum extent feasible. And again, my opinion, HCI and most other building officials will not respond very well if what you propose is nothing. You have to say, we request to be relieved of this burden. We have an unreasonable hardship, but what we can do is X, Y, and Z. Right, uh, an alteration, an alternate method of compliance is not a waiver of compliance. It's just another yes. means of providing something similar. So going a little deeper on this, the unreasonable hardship. So if removing a barrier, an accessibility barrier, to make one element accessible, which in itself changes an accessible element to become non-accessible, well, that does not meet the intent of the code here. So our example, if you're changing an accessible, a non-accessible drinking fountain and making it a high-low, and as you do that, if that would make an adjacent door clearance non-accessible, I think you all get this kind of obviously, that's not gonna be allowed by code. The overall increase of accessibility may be considered in an unreasonable hardship submittal. So I think, uh, as we said earlier, all projects, regardless of construction cost, are eligible for the unreasonable hardship. I think some people are under the impression the 20% thing, that's it. And if you don't qualify, you're out of luck. That, that's really not true. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> Unless otherwise specified in the code, equivalent facilitation must be provided when the unreasonable hardship is granted. And that is defined in code as the use of designs, products, or technologies as alternatives to those prescribed, resulting in substantially equivalent or greater accessibility and usability. In some instances, the code specifies the equivalent facilitation requirements. In instances where the code does not specify the equivalent facilitation requirement, the applicant requesting the unreasonable hardship must propose the means by which equivalent facilitation will be achieved. I think we're, we're beginning to repeat ourselves here. Um, moving on, next slide. Okay, so this is kind of 
what we've been talking about up to this point is going through the building code with chapter one and chapter two definitions and scoping in a very broad context from chapter two in the building code. Now moving forward to the accessibility stuff, chapter 11B. This next slide is on the uh, construction tolerances. So it's under 11B 104.1. Dimensions that are not stated as maximum or minimum are absolute. We don't actually have very many absolutes anymore in the code. The sub point here, the 104.1.1, construction and manufacturing tolerances. So the real point here, the focus of this part of the discussion is all dimensions are subject to conventional industry tolerances, except where the requirement is stated as a range with specific minimum and maximum endpoints. Uh, next slide. Chapter 11B requires placement of most accessible items and elements within a range that defines specific minimum and maximum dimensions. Uh, 11B 104.1.1 excludes the allowance of tolerance in the case of an allowed range within the requirement. In this case, the minimum and maximum dimensions effectively are absolute. Note that if an item or element was installed under a previous code that only stated a single dimension, then construction tolerances still apply when verifying compliance. So I wanna uh, discuss this in a little bit more detail. A garden variety version of this would be um, the your parking stalls and the 2% maximum. The 2% maximum slope requirements do not have a maximum and minimum. Therefore, you're eligible to plead your case of a manufacturing or construction tolerance. So you may wanna argue that, gee, my parking stall has 2.2% slope and maybe that's within a construction tolerance. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, and that you'd have to plead your case to HCI or your building officials because there is no maximum and minimum stated. Now, the last paragraph there that was brought in is an example of an absolute. One of the very few places in the code now where there is an absolute dimensional requirement, and that's at grab bars in a toilet room. So the code requires one and a half inches between the edge of the grab bar and the wall surface. Well, the wall surface in a toilet room may be tile or some other slightly irregular surface. That's a, a good case where, yeah, there's a manufacturer's or construction tolerance. Having to measure exactly one and a half inches is a little unreasonable. So what's the next item on this? um next slide basically just yeah just stating that construction tolerance can be applied to this um i'll go into the stoke copy requirements i'm going to speed up just a little bit because we're okay still a way to go um okay. so the scoping requirements um all areas of a newly designed a newly constructed building and facility and altered portions of an existing building and facility shall comply with these requirements okay the application based on the building or facility use, um, you have to consider additions. Uh, each addition to a, an existing building or facility shall comply with the requirements. Alterations, again, anything new needs to comply. Where we get into technically infeasible um, in alterations, where the enforcing authority determines that it's technically infeasible, um, some allowances can be made but the details of the finding and full compliance with the requirement is that is technically feasible shall be recorded and entered into the files so that there is a record of anything that was agreed to as being technically infeasible. Um, and alteration of single elements, we'll go to examples of that, but um, if you alter a single element in a room, it does not trigger additional uh, uh, path of travel. Okay. Um, okay, let's continue with the scoping requirements. Uh, the CBC requires all areas of newly constructed buildings 
and facilities and altered portions of those buildings and, and uh, existing buildings to be accessible and be served by an accessible route. Each, por each portion of a room or space shall comply with the requirements for the use associated with that portion of the room. Alterations to existing facilities must include an accessible path to the altered area, including elements that co shall comply with 11B 202.4. So the removal of the existing barriers to accessibility in the path of travel is required for all projects unless covered by an exemption. So the five items that we looked at before are the defaults. and we'll cover those in a second. The existing conditions along the path of travel shall be accessed against current code requirements or the previous code edition. Um, so it can go back to 2016. Anything that's non-compliant prior to that will is considered non-compliant. Status of, and then that is an exception only for accessibility requirements. Okay, when we say that if it was installed in compliance with the code it was, what, under which it was built, that does not apply to accessibility. It only goes back um, to this code cycle and the previous, immediately previous cycle. Okay, required accessibility elements shall be located on the path of travel or serving the area of work and must be in the facility under HKI jurisdiction. Okay, the path of travel elements must be, again, uh, associated with the project and it also is dependent on the, the occupants of that project. So let's look at uh, single elements. So alterations of single elements shall comply with the applicable uh, um, alterations for a single element does not constitute an altered space and does not trigger path of travel in itself. When multiple elements are altered in the same space, the item, the entire room or space may be made accessible, including the path of travel requirements. Okay, and we're gonna look at some examples of this. Uh, the addition of an electrical outlet in a patient room is considered a single element and the outlet must be located within the reach range as required by the code. A single element does not trigger additional path of travel requirements and exception under exception 7 is not relevant. Okay, Multiple outlets when considered together would not amount to an alteration if there is no other work. If the project includes an alteration of other elements as well, then these are no longer single elements. So if you're doing three out electrical outlets, that's considered, we're considering a single element. But now you're doing some outlets, you're doing some, putting some lighting in and uh, maybe hanging a new mirror or relocating it. Now you are no longer under that single element. Another example would be a door frame and hardware in an office that needs to be replaced due to wear and tear. This would be considered a single element as it is a complete system and it would not require the entire room to be made accessible. So you can insert this, uh, look at an example here, and you can have a whole door frame side light. Um, when you replace this door, it's considered a single element. Now that door would need to be installed in compliance with the code, but it would not trigger additional path of travel requirements. Here also we're looking at a ceiling element um, would be also considered a single element, but you're installing the grids, the, the wires, the ACT, all would be considered a single element if you're replacing the ceiling. So the ceiling is considered a system and we're looking at that as a single element. Nice. Going back to uh, scoping requirements for an altered element or space in a relevant project. For projects that occur within the confines of a space or room, the altered element or space is the entire altered space or room. So let's take a look at another example here. A project proposes to replace the ceiling in an imaging department waiting area. The scope would also include the adjacent registration area, adding new soffits over the reception station. The altered element or space is the entire ceiling in this area. As required by section 202.3, the entire area must meet the requirements of 11B, division two, including path of travel to the specific area of the alteration. The ceiling and soffit additions are not considered a single element. A room or area outside of the specific area of the alteration is not required to be made accessible 
even if it's a required element of the unit in which the work is proposed. Okay. Another example is a project proposal to replace the ceiling in an entrance lobby of a hospital. The altered element or space is the entire entrance lobby. In this case, the ceiling is considered a single element and no further upgrades would be required. If the work was, if there was more work than just the ceiling, then the entire lobby would have to meet the requirements of 11B-202 uh, for path of travel. One more example, a project proposes to alter two CT scan rooms. The work includes equipment replacement, new flooring, new ceiling work, and modifications to mechanical and electrical systems. The altered element or space and the specific area of the alteration are both of the CT scan rooms. Path of travel updates will need to be addressed as part of this project. A dressing room elsewhere in the same radiological or imaging service space is not within the specific area of the alteration. Therefore, accessibility of the dressing room is not required as part of the proposed project. Remember, it's important to define these, the boundary scope uh, of your work. And note that a dressing room is not a toilet or bathing facility that serves the area of alteration. So it doesn't meet the requirements of a path of travel and can't be, isn't gonna be required to be upgraded for path of travel work. But again, the wait, in this case, the waiting room is outside the scope of this project, so it would not need to be upgraded even if non-compliant. And there again, the owner may want to make them compliant at the time of construction just because they are liable. Bill? Yes, yeah, so uh, another example here, we've got um, a whole other type of spin on this. So for projects that are not occurring within the confines of a space or room, the altered element or space and the specific area of alteration shall be defined by the physical area in which the work is to occur. In some cases, the specific area of alteration is best described as a series of specific areas that may or may not be physically connected. So this example is one I've personally encountered not that long ago where we had um, a, <laughs> got a little distracted there, um, a window Sorry. and door replacement project. So the window and door, the nature of that kind of project, you're doing a little bit of work in a whole bunch of different rooms. So how do we interpret this? So in this case, uh, the specific area of alteration may be the immediate area of construction at each individual window and each individual door. Therefore, in this example, the altered element or space is a small portion of different rooms. The replacement of windows and doors is not considered, quote unquote, an alteration project. So it would not have to meet the requirements of 11B202.4. And of course, would then not trigger the path of travel. Slightly different spin on that, if in kind of similar, but if you're doing soffit work above all those windows and doors. This type of alteration project affects, again, a small portion of many areas within the building in different rooms. The specific area of alteration may be considered the immediate area of construction at each soffit. Therefore, in this example, the altered element or space is a small portion of several different rooms. The requirements of Division II apply to each area that is altered that has an altered soffit. Section 11B202.4, which is the path of travel requirement to each individual soffit being replaced, an accessible primary entrance and toilet and bathing facilities, drinking fountains, signage, and telephones must be provided. So Richard, I'm not clear, is this yours or is this mine? Uh, I'll take this one. Okay. Just a lot of reading here. So again, we apologize for all the reading, but I think the examples are useful. A facility proposes to repair various fire life safety deficiencies in the hospital. The scope of the project includes many locations throughout the hospital where fire dampers are added and wall penetrations are sealed. Much of the proposed work occurs above the ceiling, but some work occurs below the ceiling. 
In the, this example, the altered element or space should be defined as the immediate area of construction work, whether above the ceiling or below. The altered element or space does not automatically become the entire room in which a small repair occurs. That's important to remember. In this case, a small portion of the room uh, is being altered and the altered element or space is the immediate area in which the alteration occurs. If any of the proposed work affects an accessibility requirement, it shall be made to comply with those requirements. It is also required that the work comply with the current code requirements. In this example, it's probable that there will be no upgrades that would be required by a fire, damper, and penetration sealing work. So again, we're limiting the scope of work to the actual work. It's not going to trigger something throughout. Okay. For projects without a well-defined specific area of alteration, the facility may provide the required accessibilities, features, the path of travel, accessible toilet and bathing facilities, drinking fountain signs, and the telephone in a central location. So you have this work spread out all over the place and you have to do path of travel. You can do it maybe in one major uh, location such as a public toilet or something like that. This is yours, Bill. Okay, technically infeasible. So drilling down a little deeper on that, technically infeasible does not mean a financial or operational inconvenience. It is defined in the CBC section 202 as an alteration of a building or a facility that has little likelihood of being accomplished because the existing structural conditions require the removal or alteration of a load bearing member that is an essential part of the structural frame or because other existing physical or site constraints prohibit modification or addition of elements, spaces, or features which are in full and strict compliance with the minimum requirements for new construction and which are necessary to provide accessibility. If full compliance with the minimum requirements is found to be technically infeasible, the alteration shall include equivalent facilitation, which we, we discussed earlier. Uh, next. In determining equivalent facilitation, consideration shall be given to means that provide for the maximum independence of persons with disabilities while, present, while presenting the least risk of harm, injury, or other hazard to such persons or others. Okay. Uh, go, so looking at, um, again, this, this whole section is called scoping requirements. So it's very important that you're defining the scope of the work. You, you're going to he hear that uh, repeatedly as we go through this. But in this example, we're converting an old nursing unit into in a multi-story hospital into administrative space, uh, which includes retasking the patient rooms as private offices. This is a very common project. The patient rooms have attached private toilet rooms, most of which are not accessible. While only 10% of the patient rooms were required to be accessible, in this case, all the staff employee to toilet rooms are required to be accessible. Now, before we go much further with that, let me change the slide. The private offices are considered employee workstations and must comply with section 203.9 which requires them to be on an accessible route with limited accessibility requirements in the private office itself. However, the attached toilet rooms are not considered workstations, but rather serve that workstation. As such, it is not specifically exempted from 11B213. That, require, that requires where toilet facilities and bathing facilities are provided, they shall comply with 11B213. Okay. So, Private officers, so there's no functional requirement to provide a private toilet off of a private office, as Bill mentioned earlier. An abandonment of these toilets would result in compliance. So if you got rid of the toilets, you'd be in compliance. However, that's really not feasible. If Even if the plumbing fixtures were removed, plumbing lines to these fixtures could result in uh, deadheads. Um, the significant disruption to the building would could be costly and um, needs to balance out with a with the type of work you're doing so this work can be found to be technically infeasible 
and the existing toilet rooms may remain without accessibility alterations. However, equivalent facilitation under 202.3 will require occupants of these private offices to have reasonable access. So they must have a common staff toilet within 200 feet of the space. And at a minimum, 10% of the private offices should be include uh, private toilet rooms that are altered to become accessible. Okay, and this is something we worked out with DSA and they agree with this interpretation. So the 10% doesn't typically require apply to the offices, but in this case, considering the expense of changing it, it's and you're still providing a, a common toilet, uh, you're meeting that requirement. Again, as I mentioned, this is 11B202.4. These are the defaults. If every project is intended to be have a primary entrance become compliant, a toilet and bathing facilities serving the area, the drinking fountains, the public telephones, and the signs. Okay, that is the default. With the default, there are tons of exceptions, and we'll go through those. Um, or there's 10 exceptions now. There are two distinct factors regarding accessibility compliance in alteration projects. The first is the specific area of the alteration. The second is path of travel. So if the specific area needs to be in compliance, and then you also have to look at the path of travel, which we've been talking about pretty much all day. Um, the purpose of this CAN is the specific area of the alteration is to, is to provide equivalent um, accessibility to the altered element or space described. The language primary accessible path of travel shall include indicates that in most projects accessible must be de demonstrated or provide outside of the specific area of the alteration. So if it is required as part of the alteration, it does not count for path of travel. Every project subject to the requirements 11B202.4 shall demonstrate compliance for a primary entrance, primary path of travel to the specific area, of toilet and bathing facilities, drinking fountains, signs, and public toilets serving the area. Again, these are the defaults. This is the definition of path of travel. An identifiable accessible route within an existing site, building, or facility by means of which a particular area may be approached, entered, and exit, and which connects a particular area with the exterior approach, including your sidewalks, streets, and parking areas and entrances to the facility. Okay, this is all part of the path of travel. A submittal drawings for projects subject to path of travel need to graphically identify the path of travel and document accessible elements serving the area of work. That's important. It has to be serving the area of work along the path of travel to the area of alteration. Okay, accessible elements identified shall comply with the present or the immediately preceding code or be brought into compliance with current requirements. Okay, if Signage on the path of travel to the area of work does not meet the present or previous code. It can be considered for replacement as part of your accessible path of travel upgrades. Okay, when we're looking at primary entrance, it's uh, the principal entrance through which most people enter the building. Toilet and bathing facilities serving the area must meet the requirements of, must be accessible and include those required for each user group. Um, where separate toilets are provided for the exclusive use of separate user groups, the toilet facilities serving each user group shall comply with this section. Therefore, we have staff, patient, and public with health care. And the plumbing code requires separate toilet facilities shall be provided for the use of patients, staff, and visitors, which is your public. Okay, looking at an example of public, staff, and patient. Bill, I'll let you explain yeah. this one. Yeah, so we've got a couple of examples here. The point of these next three examples is to delineate the difference in which user groups, toilet rooms, are you required to upgrade. This first example is all three. The example is an alteration of an imaging department. Bottom line, you'll have to do 
toilet rooms that serve the public and the staff and the patients. So you could be easily triggering five toilet room upgrades on a remodel project of your imaging department. Now, if we can go to the second example. I just want to note here, because we had a question on this, with a note at the end of this, a single occupancy toilet will be labored as all gender. That does not, um, you still are required to provide the same number of toilets, even if they're labeled all gender. So if there are five or two a male and female, female staff toilet required, two all gender toilets will be required. So then these next two examples simply are illustrating there are other types of projects that may not touch on all three of those user groups. The second example is one that touches on public and staff only. The nature of it is altering a non-accessible patient room. So when you go through this process, you're not gonna be asked to provide an accessible patient toilet room because the project itself isn't dealing with an accessible patient room. The third example is an example of a staff only project. So I'm, I'm so glad that HKI has this example shown because it does come up pretty frequently. If you're down in the basement of a project uh, building, your alteration project may very well only be used by staff. So kind of logically, the only toilet rooms that you need to make accessible would be staff toilet rooms. Um, what else? So this is uh, toilet and bathing rooms are regulated by 11B213. The toilet room is defined in the plumbing code CPC section 220 as a room within or on a premises containing water closets, urinals, and other required facilities. Mm -hmm. Serving the area. So we get into the 200 foot rule on this. Most of you that have done HKI work for many years are pretty familiar with the 200 foot rule. So the essence of this is that it's understood when you are doing remodeling work. If we have, we probably have 50 to 100 toilet rooms on that given floor of the hospital. So being reasonable within 200 feet, HKI will allow you to claim that these toilet rooms serve the area of your project. That's the essence of this paragraph. So an example, a nurse's station being remodeled on the first floor of a hospital. Turns out in this case, the toilet rooms for those nurse staff are not accessible per the current code or the immediately preceding code and happen to be located on the second floor. As a result of this remodel project, those second floor inaccessible toilet rooms must be made accessible because they are the only staff toilets within a reasonable distance defined by HKI as within 200 feet. Slightly different spin on this example would be the, this next example. Same scenario, but say for the sake of the discussion that um, the accessible toilet room, the toilet rooms that serve, yikes, I got my personal phone going off. Okay. Um, the facility could choose to provide new accessible toilet rooms, most likely on that first floor as a way to resolve this issue because they're in close proximity to the remodeled nurse station. In this case, they would not be required then to upgrade those second floor toilet rooms. I think that's pretty logical. Next slide. So when there is more than one toilet facility within the reasonable distance, of the specific area of alteration and each can be considered serving the area of alteration. Only one of those is required to be made accessible. The facility may designate the toilet facilities that will be considered as serving the area as long as they are within a reasonable distance. And I think most of you have probably been there and encountered this before where you may have two or three different toilet rooms, you are allowed to say, we're going to claim these ones here as our accessible toilet rooms that serve that project. An example is an outpatient surgery department remodel project 
on the second floor of a hospital requires that an accessible toilet rooms be provided both male and female for the public off of the waiting room as well as separate accessible toilet rooms for staff. Accessible public toilet rooms are already available about 80 feet away. The existing staff toilet rooms within the department, however, are not accessible. But there are also accessible separate male and female staff toilet rooms on the first floor with a total distance that is less than 200 feet at 120. However, and I think the point of this example is in the however, in this case, the facility may not designate those other toilet rooms as serving the area of alteration because most of you probably know this, the surgery department is required by code to have staff toilet rooms inside of the boundaries of your surgery department. So you're not allowed to claim these toilet rooms that are outside of that boundary line will be claimed as your toilet rooms that serve the surgery department staff. Another example, um, an existing pharmacy does not have internal accessible staff toilet rooms and lockers. Remodel project requires that accessible staff toilet rooms, both male and female or all gender and lockers be immediately accessible. The lockers can be located within the pharmacy space, but in your particular situation, it's just not possible to fit those toilet rooms, the accessible toilet rooms due to restrictions in the size of your facility. So you could submit an unreasonable hardship AMC to provide dedicated staff toilet rooms down the corridor, but within 200 feet of the pharmacy. Condition is it must not pass through the cross corridor doors or other departments. And then we've got the whole clustered toilet room thing. So uh, code allows you to have, uh, well, let me just read it here, is defined as clustered toilet rooms is defined as multiple single user toilet rooms at a single location where multiple single user toilet rooms are clustered at a single location, only 50%, but no fewer than one of the single user toilet rooms shall comply or shall be required to comply with 11B603. And that is effectively saying they must be accessible. With all gender requirements for single user toilet rooms, clustering of unisex toilets can be considered with the following requirements. First, the count is still one toilet for up to 15 male staff and one toilet for up to 15 female staff. Second, if the single user toilet rooms are used, each would be signed as all gender. If clustered at a single location, only 50% 50, 50 of them need to be accessible. And if they're shared between compatible units, with a combined staff complement of 30 or less, one can then be required to be male at the one to 15 ratio and the other required quote unquote female at the one to 15 ratio, although each would be signed as all gender. And the travel distance of course still cannot exceed 200 feet from their most remote employee area to the furthest toilet being considered as serving the area. Um, and then the, so this paragraph here is right out of the code, word for word. This is the 11B202.4 section. The exception number four is what we're drilling in on here. The alterations solely for the purpose of barrier removal pursuant to the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, most likely due to a lawsuit. Next slide. Projects that consist solely of voluntary ADA barrier removal work or in response to a court ordered remediation might not necessarily result in compliance with the CBC chapter 11B. In this case, these areas may not be designated as accessible and may not be used in meeting the accessibility requirements or path of travel requirements for subsequent projects. Non-compliance with Chapter 11B must be clearly indicated in the barrier removal documents and signage truly 
to truly accessible facilities must be added when necessary. So real quick, I wanna put that in kind of layman's terms. If you're doing a lawsuit generated barrier removal project, it may require that you move over a toilet and a toilet room while other elements of your toilet room may not be affected for whatever reason by the lawsuit. So when you encounter that, that gets kind of tricky and you may want to sit down with HKI and talk about it because it it's certainly something that you want to consider before you claim that toilet room to be an accessible quote unquote toilet room for the purpose of future projects probably won't comply. Uh, anything else to add, Richard? No, this is that what we've come to the conclusion. It can be called an ADA toilet room if it meets all the requirements of ADA, but it does, doesn't comply with California requirements for accessibility. Okay, so um, exception seven, we're just going through the exceptions here. Projects consisting only of heating, ventilation, and air conditioning and re-roofing, electrical work not involving placement of switches and receptacles, cosmetic work, that does not affect items regulated by this code, such as painting equipment, not considered to be part of the architecture of the building or area, such as computer terminals and office equipment, shall not be required to comply. So basically, there's a this is a long exception. It's used quite a bit when you're just doing work that's electrical only. Um, and this is also where we're applying the equipment replacement um, requirement for even though imaging equipment is considered part of the architecture of the building, um, if it was new, yes, it would trigger path of travel. But if again, equipment replacement is not, it's um, the building's already been modified for those purposes at that time. Okay. Electrical receptacles, medical gas outs associated with the patient head walls do not need to be made uh, they're considered employee workstations. They are not intended for public use and they do not have to be made accessible. As for subacute projects, solely for the purpose of establishing subacute beds does not trigger additional path of travel requirements. Again, we already talked about fixed equipment, so I'm going to skip over that. So we're running it short on time here. Again, equipment replaced in kind um, does not trigger additional accessibility. Uh, movable equipment, mobile equipment uh, do not trigger accessibility. Okay, They are considered movable or mobile. Uh, path of travel requirements and alterations. Um, exception eight is the 20% that Bill had talked about earlier. Um, this is one that's applied pr pretty constantly. Uh, with most projects. When the adjusted, remember I said the uh, the default is everything has to be brought into code uh, or into path of travel compliance of that those five items. This allows 20% of the construction cost to be applied to those. Uh, for the purpose of this section, the adjusted construction cost of alterations, structural repairs or additions shall not include the cost of the alterations to path of travel elements. So again, if you're doing a path of travel upgrade, that is not included in your construction cost. For existing buildings and facilities, removal of existing barriers to accessibility in the path of travel does not require additional path of travel requirements. Um, and applications for filed for unreasonable hardship uh, may uh, the 20% may be applied even though if it's considered unreasonable compared to the cost of construction. So if you have a $50,000 or a $150,000 bathroom project or a room project, but it's going to, the only thing that's not accessible is a toilet nearby that's going to cost $200,000 to replace, that would be considered in, uh, out of balance and you can apply for a hard, hardship and only apply 20% of the cost to somewhere else that, to make it more accessible. 
When you're looking at um, an example, a nursing unit being altered to become a pediatric unit will require the play area, similar to the example we looked at above, and an associated toilet room. In example A, the play area uh, must have a patient toilet adjacent to it. In this new, if this is a new toilet, it is satisfying the functional requirement and may not may and may not be counted as the path of travel requirement. In example B, the existing non-accessible staff toilet already serving the nursing unit may continue to be used. A new toilet does not need to be created to meet the functional requirement. Uh, so this would not meet the requirement of path of travel and 20% would have to be applied elsewhere. Okay, so um, thank you, Richard. So we're gonna do a hypothetical case study just to set in concrete uh, some of these concepts. So this is a hypothetical obstetrics remodel project. Uh, next slide. Hey, Richard. <laughs> next slide, there we go. So this first piece of it, we're separating out the site piece of it from the interior piece of it. So if you're doing an addition to a hospital or work that's involving site work, there's three paths of travel that are part of the path of travel obligation. There's path of travel to the public way, then separately path of travel to an accessible passenger loading zone, and then thirdly accessible route to accessible parking. Um, so what are we checking for on remodel projects? And really the focus of this 11B202.4 is these five items here, the primary entrance, the toilet and bathing facilities, drinking fountains, telephones, and the signage. Um, so looking at that graphically with your hypothetical floor plan, the interior path of travel is your accessible entrance. Those are almost always accessible one quick item on that is the force to open the doors. If your remodel project is the obstetrics unit and your path of travel goes through this entrance, be sure to check the force to open those doors. So that's otherwise kind of a gimme. Next item is the drinking fountains and telephones. And frankly, everybody's hospitals ought to have these accessible by now, but the purpose of this uh, path of travel exercise is to confirm that those are compliant to current code and they serve the area of this alteration. And then of course, the part we really wanna talk about is the toilet rooms, the accessible male and female public toilet rooms, and then accessible male and female staff toilet rooms, and then an accessible patient toilet room, which is almost always gender neutral. So you could very well be triggering five toilet rooms. Now, back on the exterior work, so the concept here is responsibility for your property starts at the property line. So for your exterior type projects, your path of travel will go all the way to the parking stalls, the public way and the passenger loading zone. So quick sidebar, we wanna talk about that gender neutral thing. Um, California law, and it's getting to be quite a few years ago now that they triggered this. So this is for single user toilet rooms. So if we go to the plumbing code, of course we have to comply with all of the codes, including the plumbing code. The plumbing code has not caught up yet with California law, so the plumbing code still refers to male and female toilet rooms. So the way that HKI has uh, responded and, and interprets this, I think makes a lot of sense. More or less, they say, if we go to the next slide, that the plumbing code requires one male staff plus <coughs> one female staff, that's two toilet rooms. Therefore, you're required to have two accessible staff toilet rooms to serve the area of your alteration. And you may have some room to negotiate. If you've got a ridiculously small number of staff, you may approach HPI and say, look, we've only got three staff in this whole area. Do I really have to provide two toilet rooms and have that conversation with your folks over at HKI? 
Yeah, and there is an allowance for that as well. So that's a good point, Bill. So recommendation, determine the plumbing code compliance first. And your last step in the process would be to determine the signage on the door. So back in our example, here's how it would go. We've, we're planning on the left-hand side there, the male and female staff toilet rooms. What happens actually most of the time, go ahead and click it over. Yeah, those two toilet rooms there, those are probably going to get signed as gender neutral and gender neutral. Now, Richard, I don't know if we've got the time, but what do you think of the clustering concept here? 50%? Yeah. yeah, if they were side by side and both all gender, uh, only one of them would need to be made accessible. That's a perfect okay. example of clustering. Now on the public ones, depending if those are single occupancy or multiple occupancy, that would apply there as well. If they're multiple occupancy, no, you can't do that. But if they're single occupancy uh, next to each other, that would apply. Only one of them would need to be made accessible. Awesome. I like that answer. So that's all I've got on this uh, example. Okay, thank you, Bill. Um, okay, we're gonna look at some general exceptions. Sites, buildings, facilities, and elements are exempt from these requirements. Um, as well as um, employee workstations show, uh, shall be on an accessible route, but they don't have to meet all the reach range requirements um, that are identified here. So circulation path, this is an important one that's also often misused. An exterior interior uh, way of passage from one place to another for pedestrians or this DSA defines as an exterior interior way of passage provided for pedestrian travel, including but not limited to walks, sidewalks, hallways, courtyards, elevators, platforms, most ramps, etc. cetera. Um, note that it doesn't mention inside of a patient room or something. But then we go get common use. Common use is the interior, exterior circulation paths, rooms, spaces or elements that are not for public use and made available for shared use of two or more people, okay? And then you have the employee work area that is specific to any por no portion of a space used by the employees and only for work. Um, it's important to distinguish between these and we're gonna look at some examples here. Um, employee, in this case, the staff personnel, just identify an employee and then their workstation is where they're at and where they do their duties. So employee workstations are required to comply with the following, have an accessible means of egress and have an uh, audible alarm coverage, have the ground and floor clearance requirements, the change of levels, uh, the reach ranges, um, and the, the door openings uh, be compliant. Employee workstations shall, shall be on an accessible path now your exceptions are receptacles, controls, and switches that are an integral part of the workstation furnishings, fixtures and equipment shall not be required to comply with the accessibility requirements. Okay. Okay, section 1009 requires an accessible route complying with 11B402 um, and also requires the width and the requirement applies to the opening to the workstation shall be accessible. An example is a sterile compound and clean room are examples of employee workstations. Even if there are several workbenches or biosafety cabinets in the buffer room, the ante room is the beginning of the workstation and the needs to be on an accessible route with the compliant width of a door opening. Everything beyond the ante room door, it is considered part of the employee workstation is not required to be accessible. So another example is a medication room with three work counters. In this case, the room is considered common use. There's two or more stations to be used in there. Only one of those stations need to be made accessible. The other two do not. Uh, for protruding objects, this is where we're getting into the circulation path. 
Objects protruding from a wall or an object along a circulation path shall be restricted to the limits provided in 11B307, which is the four inches from the wall. Um, a sink within a patient room is not considered an obstruction. A, a patient room does not have a circulation path. It is not a, um, a corridor, it's not a hallway. Um, one of the certain types of rooms that would fall into this would be conference rooms and waiting rooms because they are the circulation path is around the perimeter of the room. Okay. This is talking about weather protection by a canopy or roof overhead shall be provided at medical care and long-term facilities. Must be minimum of one accessible entrance. It does not have to be the primary entrance and the passenger drop-off and loading zone is required to be protected from the weather. The vehicle pull-up space is not required to be protected from the weather. For an existing building that do not have protected accessible entrances, project, uh, they are not required to provide an additional one. In a licensed medical care and long-term facilities where the period of stay exceeds 24 hours, patient bedrooms or resident sleep rooms shall be provided in accordance with these requirements. Um, for hospitals, rehab facilities, psychiatric facilities, and detox facilities, all public use and common use areas shall be accessible in compliance with this chapter. Okay, for facilities not specializing in treating conditions that affect mobility, 10%, but no fewer than one of the patient bedrooms need to be compliant. Accessible patient bedrooms shall be dispersed in a manner that is proportionate to the type of medical specialty. For facilities specializing in conditions that treat, that affect mobility, 100%, all of the patient rooms shall be prov uh, provide mobility features. In all on-call rooms where physicians and staff on-call sleeping rooms are provided, 10% of these are used. And this is kind of where we got the 10% with the offices we looked at earlier on. And then for long care facilities, ICFs and SNFs, 50% uh, of the patient rooms need to be accessible. Note that this is rooms and not beds. So it's 50% of the rooms. It's the same for all of these. Following patient rooms and their associated toilet rooms are subject to 10% rule. This is a nursing service space and patient rooms, labor, delivery, and recovery areas. Accessible patient rooms and new construction ought to be, to be dispersed in proportion to the type being provided. So you want to make sure they're spread out through the facility pretty good. If you change a patient room, licensure, uh, there are three levels of patient room accessibility required for healthcare facilities based on the function of the room. As we just mentioned, that 10% for areas not treating mobility, 100% for mobility, and 50% for long-term care. Okay, skilled nursing facilities at 50%. I'm going to skip through some of this because it's kind of getting repetitive here. Again, we provided a ton of examples in the in the can so that th these things can be cleared. So, um, do you want me to speak to these, Richard? Sure. Um, so, we'll try to cut to the chase here on alteration projects. The the question comes up. How do you do the number crunching? If you've got these 10% most frequently requirement that 10% of the rooms have to be accessible, but gee, I'm only remodeling this many rooms. The bottom line is you'll be held accountable for your scope of work. So if your renovation, we have an example, I think on the next page, but um, so you might, to rip through the clicks and get to that example on the next page. Yeah. So this example, if you've got a hundred patient bedrooms of which only five are accessible, uh, your remodel project is going to be of 20 rooms. 
you're only going to be held responsible for your 20 rooms and they will apply that 10 percent requirement to those 20 rooms that you're working on 10 percent of 20 is two you'll be asked to provide two more accessible rooms brings you to seven ultimately you want to get your facility up to 10 percent of 100 which is 10 you're in process but not quite there yet so I think you guys probably get that easier than I we can explain it. So moving on to the next example in a skilled nursing, uh, kind of a similar arrangement. You've got 75 rooms, only seven are accessible. The scoping is 50%. So you are way, way short. However, you're remodeling one room. So they don't expect you to do magic. You're gonna be held responsible for that one room, that one room, must be accessible to get you a little closer to the ultimate 50%. Next slide. Um, so I think this is another, oh, oh, so this is making the point that you cannot mix and match. You cannot take one wing of a hospital that's skilled nursing and another wing that's med surge and say, well, we have an overage in med surge, so we'll compensate for the other half. You're not allowed to do that within the categories of the 10%, 50%, and 100%. Hopefully, okay. does that make sense, Richard, the way I'm saying it? Yeah, that's to me. Um, you know, I think we're gonna stop there and go to questions. Okay. We're stopping a little short of the full presentation, but the information is in the can. This is pretty much word for word what's in the can, but I'd like to go to questions and I don't know about Bill, but I can run a little long if there's additional questions. Sure, sure. Um, so I'm gonna jump over to the last slide here. The question slide. Yeah. One that keeps trying to come up. And